Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Caligari, and uh, I'm the community organizer for um, Project Kubert. Um, welcome. Uh, this is your chance to meet your developers and contributors and uh, talk about community issues. Okay. Um, let me share my screen and uh, I'll share our meeting notes. And I will post the link to chat so everybody can fill out their attendance. We track that. So if you could, please add your name. Thank you. OK, a lot of uh, I have to take the first two uh, um, items on the agenda this week. Um, I want to bring everybody's uh, attention to the incubation status um, via poll 111. It has been merged, and we have uh, we've submitted the that document to the TOC. And I actually forgot to post that link, so give me just a second here, and I'll find it. As we are the very latest pull request. So super easy to find. Okay, so there's our two pull requests. Um, please review this. Um, this again, this affects us all. Um, and I think Elena has already uh, um, made some comments for me to take care of. <laughs> She's fast. Okay. Um, sorry, that was really fast. Um, moving on to events. Do we have Alicia with us? Alicia, we need you to talk today. Um, Sam, have you talked to Alicia in the last day or two? Um, let's see. Talked with her last meeting uh, Wednesday, but I have not heard from her. I got an email thread from her, though, but nothing that needed my attention yet. Okay. Yeah, same. She was uh, asking about uh, a project roadmap. Speaking of project roadmaps, um, David Vassell, if I could grab some of your time today um, to do a last review of our roadmap. Uh, I know we spent a lot of time on it before, um, so it uh, might just need a little uh, polish and shine. Do we have a <clears throat> do we have a link to our roadmap we can post? Maybe we can just. Uh, I've been using the roadmap that we put into community poll 111. Uh, We've been uh, doing some work on uh, the Kubert Kubert and uh, putting tech and enhancement tags on, uh, on issues and then creating milestones. So that, that work is just getting started. Okay, I see. Okay. We have a future roadmap there. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we already went over that. Um, I, I guess what's your concern about submitting that to incubation? Yeah. And uh, Alicia is going to advertise that list also to uh, KVM Forum. So we just need to make sure that she's current. It's to the best of our knowledge. Okay, it looks it looks accurate. Um, I, I'm sure that items will get added to that list, but. Uh, Cool. Thanks, David. Um, all things open. Um, Stu is on PTO until the 15th, I think. Um, do we have Kevin with us today? We don't. Okay. So, Sam, you're working with us on that, right? Yeah, I put some images up last night. 
um, cool. that may help. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a priority for us uh, this week. Um, sorry, I didn't I didn't uh, connect with you late in the day yesterday. Um, they got a hold the see Ospo got a hold of me and said let's uh, roll with the the TOC poll. So now that's done, I can switch gears and help you guys out. And of course, any, anybody else who's got a Raspberry Pi or extra x86 64 laying around that wants to uh, uh help us out with this uh demo of course you're more than welcome okay i got uh i got everything i needed to get off my chest uh, uh, looks like david has the next item in the open floor <coughs> Hey, yeah, sure. Um, there was a Google uh, group mailing list post that none of us responded to. And I, I looked into it. I didn't actually have a great response. That was part of the reason why uh, it probably went um, un, unresponded to. So I'm trying to regather my thoughts around this one. Um, we have a readiness probe that's going to check a, um, a health C endpoint in all of our components. And in that component, we have um, the version of the API uh, server that we're talking to. And I have no idea what that's used for. Like we do, um, we, we keep track of it. We even have like a lock around it and things like that to ensure that it's accurate and we serve it up. Uh, on this health Z endpoint, and it it's been there since the beginning of Kubevert practically, and I have no explanation for why. Uh, does anyone know why? Maybe maybe Roman. So like, uh, <laughs> we, we fetch we we just fetched the version because there are no special privileges needed. It's kind of a license uh, we we had in the past. I don't I'm not sure how much of an issue it is right now, but we had in the past a lot of issues that we were actually connect it looked like we are connected from the kubernetes client perspective the, the components were running but um, we had in practice lost connectivity to the api server and sure i, I get that i get that yeah. you know we're using the version because that's anyone yeah. can connect to that why are we storing the version why we're serving it uh, storing it and serving it like what what purpose does it have for us to maintain that version uh, internally. It has no special meaning, which just, it's, I, I, I don't get the email completely, to be honest. Well, the email is uh, mostly related to why, when our connectivity with the API server fails and this health Z endpoint, uh, eventually the health uh, Z uh, endpoint will start returning an error, which will cause the readiness probe uh, or yeah. liveness probe. Liveness probe will yeah, fail at some point and then it will restart, yeah. So yeah. this is the purpose of it. So it's not about the API version as such. Sure, that's the purpose of the... Um, so the only the, question remaining is why we also expose it in the, in, the, in the response or... Why do we expose it in the response and why do we uh, keep track of it at all? What's the purpose of us? I don't think we keep track of it in any way. We just fetch whatever there is and expose it to the health chat endpoint. I'm not sure what this means that we keep track of it. We just fetch it and expose it in the response. Hey, Lubo here. I, I think it was part of the optimization. So we are hitting the API servers pretty quite often. Ah, OK. This is the, okay. Uh, Okay, so this is about the optimization which Marcus did, so that we're not querying so often the API server. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, a version is nil. Okay, so that's why we're uh, keeping the version, maybe. I see. Yeah, yeah. I okay. guess we are, we are set the version when the informers will lost or drop the connection to API server. So, so yeah, but the, the, the API server version as such has no special meaning. I think Marcus just refactored it and wanted to keep the response the same as it was before. 
I see. But it has no special meaning, except that we hit it. I see. OK. That's interesting. Uh, hmm. So our behavior looks like it's changing then in the newer version, where uh, do we actually still detect when the version endpoint yeah, is failing? Yeah, it's just cached for some time. So the the or not cached. There is now a, a an extra loop, which is periodically updating, checking if it can still connect to the API server, and the health check just in the and the health check just fetches that then from internally and exposes it. And if it's not there, then the post the pod goes to hold. Okay. Well, for the purposes of this discussion, that's good enough for me. I just wanted to know what the mm -hmm. version was for and I, I get it now. So it's it's part of this caching. All right. And so yeah, the health check can have a lower uh, period with that and can also check internal stuff. And basically just the liveness probe to the API server is decoupled a little bit more and can have a lower frequency. That's the main purpose of this. Okay. And maybe to go back to the, the Google um, uh, groups thread, uh, do we have an explanation for why it's better to restart for handler rather than leave it running under the expectation that it eventually restarts? Yeah. So this is the historical thing that we had a lot of issues with uh, word handlers, which looked healthy, but were not. And we had no, then there were a lot of different cases where uh, where where parts of the network are reachable, other parts were not. And so you could sometimes reach other pods, but not the API server and so on. And what proved to be the only really effective method was to just restart the handle at some point. Okay. And it was not in, uh, and this was related to a lot of different issues. Like for instance, in OpenShift, there were for a very long time, some DNS issues where the DNS servers on the nodes were sometimes reconfigured or something and then already running pods lost connectivity but it's not only open shift there are a lot of things like this and we could catch all of this with just restarting in this case got it perfect okay i'll, I'll try to craft a response mm -hmm. to this so but I, yeah but as i said i don't know how i mean kubernetes has majored a lot since then also in that area so i'm not sure if it's still necessary but it's the most safe way to ensure that all these issues are resolved. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, I was actually slightly late to the meeting because I was reading this exact uh, mail thread. So I'll remove it from down here. Okay. Uh, and that takes us to the end of the open floor. Does anybody else have anything they would like to talk about? Yeah, um, hey Sam here. Uh, going back to the all things open real quick, mm -hmm. I just want to kind of draw a bit of attention to the thread. I found a few projects I think will kind of tie the glues together between you know using WireGuard and such. Mm -hmm. There's a CNI plugin. Um, that was actually made by, um, started by a guy in Red Hat, but you know, it went full open source and it works with existing CNIs. So if we end up using Flannel, that works too, or it can replace the whole thing. Um, I encourage you all to you know, give, a, give a whack at playing with it because I think that that, um, that CNI will definitely be the easy glue together to get a cluster working across different NATs, even, which is surprisingly makes it super simple as far as annotations. Uh, it's called Kilo, and I, uh, it's in the thread, but I'll, I'll uh, really, really get here. And that, also... uh, kilo as in like kilogram? Yeah. Okay. You never know how they spell these projects these days. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, I've got that added to the notes. 
Cool. Yeah, I look forward to working with that. Uh, I'm just going to, I have a super simple network with like a Chromecast on my network. So I'm just, <laughs> it's going to be a, a really easy setup for me. Oh yeah, you'll like that then. He's got to put forward one of the wire guard points. So one of your nodes and you're set. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was, oh, you can still, you can still land a workload that can, that can fan out from, from the node and do network discovery, et cetera. Nothing to discover over here, so. Yeah, we're definitely gonna have to get rolling on that um, September 8th and, and Stu is out for another week. I don't mind picking up my slide. I mean, this is this is related to is a, a related project and that's kind of the repo I uploaded it to called Tier K that we're working on, which essentially does a lot of this site to site networking, but also in a sense where you can route to your pod network for you through your default gateway. So like I could ping an Nginx pod for my PC, for example. Uh, oh, sorry, not tier gate, uh, tier K, uh, TE, that project, I'll, I'll like it too. Um, okay. But a lot of that oh. work and the research that was done that kind of relates to this actually kind of falls in hand with what they're trying to do, what you all are trying to do doing uh, all things open. So I uh, definitely want to like explore kind of lines that are crossed between that. Cool. Here correctly. There you go. Okay. Um, anything else, guys? We're all here. Um, Chandler Wilkinson um, created an Argo CD uh, item. Uh, he posted he posted uh, an email out to mailing list. Uh, he would like somebody to have a look at what he's got going on there. Any volunteers? Going once, twice. Uh, let's have a look. Thank you, Roman. Yeah, he's doing some good stuff. He's uh he's going through our catacoda scenarios and uh, making sure that they're they're in line with what we're advertising on the website and in uh, due diligence documents and. So I, I think Alicia is going to be using some of this stuff on the GVM forum demo for the sake of speed. Okay, um, we're at 7.22 and we haven't done a bug scrub in quite a while. So it's going to be a big one this week. Roman, would you like to volunteer for that also? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit distracted today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit out of time for some things. Would, would appreciate if someone else does it. Is it a full moon or is it me? Because I've been I've been awake now for two hours and I've, <laughs> I've been run ragged myself. David, maybe you can. I don't mind. <clears throat> I don't mind talking. Is some can somebody share the list? Doesn't set host name as fully qualified domain name. Enhancement.
So this is a pod feature. Set host name is Yeah, this is a new field which we don't have. You can set the host name with su on subdomain. We support that. Yep. But we don't support set host name as FQDN. Uh, we don't have the, fi the, the field. Is that going to be as simple as exposing the field on the pod? Like just a transparent, uh, take the thing that's in the VMI, put it on the pod, and we get it? Or? I didn't look into this new field, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, it may mean that we have to tweak our DHCP responses and so on so that it's passed through properly. But it can also be that if it just sets the host's entries and route entries that the DHCP server picks the correct things up automatically. But we have to check that. And yeah, and the difference is that if you don't set this field, as far as I understand it, then you get really host name, in this case, WDH1. And if you set it to true, you would get WDH1 dot uh, namespace dash subdomain, or no, dot yeah. subdomain dot namespace dot service, whatever returns, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, and it can be that we have to pick up different things here in DHCP. So how, it sounds like we would approve this if it got um, written. Um, how are we marking issues as like, this is something we're going to do or, or uh, somebody can pick this up and- it, I think we have a help wanted label. There we go, added it. We also have a triage accepted. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask if this is something that they'd be interested in contributing. Let's see who this user is. Okay. Great. Next. Next one. That is me. scale profile control plane under load yeah we can handle that in the six scale meeting okay that's our iob vf interface we have somebody working on network on the call uh, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, look. Upping, upping yeah. some people. Yeah. Maybe a, a Alona and Petal candidates. I don't know. Whatever. It's not really in the, the SIG network. David Roman, do you know? Oh, I'm sorry, what? Do you know who uh, is usually in the SIG network? Do we have an official SIG network? I don't know. Well, I, no, I went ahead have. and I pinged some people uh, on it, so we should be good. Okay. Okay. How to add resource limits to the verb 
Vert API, Vert controller, Vert handler pods. This is a. Yeah, this is just a mistake. <laughs> So they use this patch. Yeah. So brand symbol from the interior sounds right. Right. Add. But yeah, they probably have to use a replace. Yeah, just try and replace. I should do it. It looks like people are already engaging with this. I think yep. we can yeah. move on. Ah, that would be interesting, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we can, but don't we set this UAD? Uh, is it like a global setting? I don't remember already. Um, I think we generated out of the name. We're generating oh. it out of oh, the VMI the UID. UID. Yeah. yeah. So every yeah. so for example, if there's a VM that has cloud or nets associated with it, every time we start the VMI, that VM, so restart the VM, it's going to execute the cloud or nets, uh, which is that bad? I, I guess I'm why would that be bad? I guess people typically would want it cached to understand that it's already been executed. Uh, okay. Maybe that makes sense. Yeah, the, I mean, I always wanted it to do redos, and my issue was always that Cloud in it by default does not do a redo. Right. But I, so, always but I write guess. My script uh, that way. But I, yeah, but I guess if. Um, the normal expectation is that it is only run once. So this is probably what he's, he or she is needing, the normal behavior. Mm. We should at least provide, give the chance to recreate the well-known behavior. Yeah, so since when does CloudNet not run more than once? I, I thought it was not like Fedora or like a machine config was like atomic and ran once. I thought CloudNet always ran every single time on boot. Yeah, so the cloud init service always runs, but the cloud init workload is actually only executed once normally. And then there are always workarounds necessary to run it more than once. Oh, interesting. OK. So it seems like we don't have that behavior. <laughs> but that's new to me, because I've seen issues also around this when the MAC address for networking and some changes that it doesn't reconfigure the network because it's only run once. So but. so we would have to generate a UID for the cloud and net, uh, store that UID in the VMI status or the VM staff, some, some status, I don't know, and yeah, regenerate so, yeah. it anytime uh, the cloud and net is mutated. I, I don't even know if we can detect that. So uh, what we have on the VM is if you create a VM, then the UID is kept because if, even if it's not set, because uh, I think we generate it out of the name and namespace or just name or something like this. 
we can well, probably it looks like we're we're generating it just out of the VMI UID. Regardless yeah. of the session. Uh, now I meant the firmware UID field. So I think his issue is Oh, I see. You're talking about yeah. that. Uh, what if we just took if it's back well if it's backed by a VM, then we should have the VM's UID somewhere in the Yeah. VMI. So if, if we just add this to metadata.json. Sure. Like he adds it, then he should get it automatically when he uses a VM. Because then we already ensure that the firmware that the UID is stable. Machine restarts. see any problem with this necessarily. Uh, is that good enough though? Because that that's quite the um, uh, unexpected configuration to get consistent cloud and net behavior. To have to set explicitly your firmware UUID and that's somehow associated with uh, whether cloud and net runs twice or not. Uh, maybe we need more time to discuss this and understand the context. Is the does anyone know if the UUID for firmware is generated uh, automatically in the VM? Like when we post a VM, if the template has this uh, does not have a UUID set for firmware, do we generate one there? This consistent? Yeah, we generate we one. Okay, so it's that's at post time, like when we post mm -hmm. the VM. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's fine because people would get that behavior by default automatically. Uh, I think that's good enough. I think I'm satisfied with that. that triage accepted label uh, yeah I'll do that thank you all righty we have time for one more Let's see so I think we're getting into a couple here of that let's see how many of these we can get through Sidecar, uh, where the OFS could give us that. Yeah. In combination with, well, yeah. But you have to yeah. share the empty disk across with the, okay. If we would back an empty disk with a Virta OFS, and you, I think you can, I don't know if we can on the sidecar also specify mount points in the annotation, maybe. I don't think we can. That's... But that would be needed too. Hmm. So I don't know how far we want to go with this. People always have the ability to modify pods themselves so they could create a mutation webhook of some sort that would inject this uh, empty disk and all of that into their sidecar container 
Yeah, so, so okay, so we, we would, so the person would add a VM uh, to a VM and empty disk with virtualfs and do the rest with uh, uh, Kubernetes webhook basically to inject the sidecar and the mount point. Yeah, so correct. Yeah, well, they don't even necessarily need to inject the sidecar in the webhook. Uh, it would just be the volume <coughs> mount. Uh, so if I look at. Yeah, I just wonder if it, it seems to be a generic purpose thing, like what what person is interested in, like log forwarding, and I guess doing everything in one webhook then sounds good. <laughs> Yeah. So is this one denied? Uh, I'm hesitant to so the psych. Let me look at how we configure the sidecar list real quick, just to make sure it's. Yeah. I don't want to completely recreate a pod or a container spec in there. Um, yeah, I think I think we're gonna let me let me I'll write it. I'll inquire okay. if uh, it's good enough to use a mutation webhook. Does this empty this to the file system or That's what I was thinking. It sure sounded like he wanted the same volume mounted to multiple VMs. No, I think it's just a, it's within the same pod. So you have a pod with an empty disk that's shared between the VMI, so the QMU guest, and another container, which is going to take whatever logs are written to that uh, shared uh, ephemeral disk and stream it somewhere. Uh, so it's taking the logs within a guest and somehow exposing that to another container, which can push it out wherever. Well, I'm not sure. On the other side is if, M so we support VirtuFS on PVCs, for instance, but I'm not sure if you can use them on empty disk right now. Uh, yeah, this empty disk, does it have a file system? I mean, what does it have? What does it look like? Yeah, empty disk is normally just uh, a Q call without mm. anything special in there. So I guess we would, yeah, I mean, we could add, I'm not sure what we would do right now there. I guess it will not work with VirtuFS, but we could make it work by just exposing the path, a path, but we don't have that right now. Yeah. All right, needs more information. Uh, so it seems like this request is, don't we have, do we have a bot today that is syncing Qbert CI with uh, the Qbert Qbert repo or is that still a manual um, process? Um, wait. Um, yeah, but there is a daily job which syncs, syncs it. So that should be, so that's how it is supposed to work. So you merge something in Qbert CI and then there it gets a PR created against Qbert, where the tests run with the new Qbert CI version, and we see if everything's working. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if how I just misunderstood that and thought that it's immediately in sync. Yeah, I'll I'll post real quick. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we have it extra separated and not automatically synced to have get pull requests so we can see if everything is still in order. So that keyboard CI can evolve without having to check on every commit if it's, everything is still fine with keyboard. A legitimate bug then? No, uh, not yet, at least. Okay. Someone's water faucet dripping. Got their terminal bell still on. I think that's the first thing I turn off every time I install a new Fedora or something. It drives me nuts. I can't. <laughs> can't take it anymore. Some people like the bell, though. <laughs> the user I hate back. it. I mean, they kill all the bells. I hate it. <laughs> like, just from existence, from all the fedoras. Okay. Another uh, SRIOB bug. Or is it the same bug just found by another person? Uh, it looks different. Are you doing that on the back end or on the? On, okay, great. I'm getting on. See if we can do one more. Yeah, let's do this one. that their application. Do we have a, a standard on how our, how our status are arranged, whether it's a uh, verb noun or noun verb. Hopefully, we'd have to look at what we actually <clears throat> have today.
I didn't feel that we uh, were as fast as Peter or Roman, but we did get quite a few bugs uh, triaged. Great. Happy? If you all are happy. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> all right. I think we're good. And we slid in right at 7.49 a.m. So one minute early. And uh, I guess we can conclude this week's meeting. All right. Sound good? Yep. All right. See you all later. Bye. See you all later. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. We'll see you next week. Bye.